when I said you don't want to asset discriminate, there's a few things. I like this guy a lot. Because he's, he speaks kind of like I do. But he's an <laughs> asset discrimination. I don't need another lawsuit, man. <laughs> Um, I like this guy a lot because he would. Who, who's ever heard of Terry Summers? Raise your hand. Good, good. He doesn't like bullshit and he tells the truth. And he he's in an asset class that I really like that everybody shits on, but it's, it's the asset that's fucking kicking ass right now. Absolutely. Yeah. So Terry's been in the game since 2012. I met Terry in 2018. 18. Mark out of the bed. Yeah, and yeah. then we met up. I just kind of like this and uh, kicked it off over there. But you, you can wholesale, well, you started buying, let's, let's, let's tell the story. Yeah, so let's tell the story, what, what got you into real estate? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this story quick because everyone's got one, right? So um, in 2011, I'm working at this uh, fitness club called, uh, you guys are from Lexington, called Urban Active. And it was like, you know, you work really, uh, really long uh, in the morning, you work all the way till night. I'm like, man, I gotta do something different. So. There was this old guy had like 34 rental properties. I'm like, he just like rode around his pickup truck all the time, did whatever the hell he wanted. And I'm like, I need to own some rental properties. This is cash flow, right? He's old and has no debt, so it's a little different. But um, so that's what got me into buying my first property. So I bought that first property for like 80 grand. Which, so he tricked you and he started with buying whole <laughs> yes. so, college, but he didn't tell you he didn't have no debt on it. He had no debt, and I so I went to college not knowing that I needed to go to, it wasn't until 2018 that I learned to go back to elementary school, which I had to, and learn how to wholesale, which was one of the one of the biggest game changers for my business in 2018 was learning how to wholesale instead of just being like, hey man, I don't have any money to buy this. Can you buy it? Because I was just giving deals away at that point. But anyway, so I bought this first property. It was an FHA house hack for 80 grand. Uh, put like five grand down, put like four grand of my own money into it, and then um, it was worth like 128,000. So then I went back to the bank six months, one day directly after. I'm like, hey, I want to refinance this thing. So we refinanced, well, I refinanced it 101,600 bucks. The cash out refi was like 27 Gs. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, this is the most amount of money I've ever seen. And after that, I was just hooked, man. Yeah. I was like, I got to keep doing this, keep doing this. Cash out refi, living off the cash out refi. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. College. College. Yeah. Just taking out loans, man. Just taking out more loans. See, if you didn't do this, the past, if you weren't in real estate the past 10 years, you don't miss the boat. I'm just going to be honest with you. Like, you couldn't fuck up almost because in why? Inflation covered all your mistakes. Yeah, right? For sure. But why I brought Terry here is because he's went through this whole cycle and he is heavily invested in single family homes, with, which a lot of people shit on. I still buy single family homes to hold to this day that I don't wholesale and flip that are in great locations. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about first, before we get into some other things, let's talk about the pros and the cons of single family homes. You always sure. hear, oh, it, you ain't gotta, you know, you're, it's, it, it, Hold it, on, what's Brock's yeah, always say? Yeah, yeah, I'd rather have a slice of watermelon than one, one whole grape. Right. And I'm like, but what if you have a whole menu, right? <laughs> yeah. And the menu makes wine, watermelon that don't turn into wine, so. That's right. <laughs> when you can, you can, here's the thing about single family, like I said earlier, I, I, I sold off about, I don't know, I think, four or six of my single family homes just to pull some cash out. Yep. Because I was getting low in reserves because I was taking a shit last year. They're excellent stores of value. Hundred percent. Like there's no way like especially like uh, Nashville, like all these cranes right if you can buy anywhere where you know where the cranes are going. And the way that I, I, I buy real estate is I don't look at like where the puck is, I'm looking at where the puck's going. So if I know the puck's going over here, I'm buying in here knowing it's gonna cash flow, but then also knowing that hey in three years, I just got a hundred grand worth of appreciation just by storing my money in there, then I can cost segregate, I'm not paying taxes, I'm offsetting other active income, and then I can just go sell at 1031 and do it like five times Which more. You, and you're saying, you're missing one thing that's the most important is that it's a lot easier to offload a single family than it is a hundred single apartment complex if you need money, you're getting a bond. It is. I got an argument with Grant Cardone in 2018 on his show mm -hmm. about this, and he always like, well, BlackRock's always buying. I said, okay. How many buyers you got for your apartments versus how many buyers do you have for single family homes? Yeah. If you get in a bond, and I'm not shitting on apartments, I own apartments. I'm just telling you, don't mass it. I'm not shitting on apartments yeah. either. I made a lot of money in apartments. Yeah, me too. But 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 I, I, he is the, the single family home guy that I wanted to bring to talk about this to give you guys some perspective on you need to have some single family homes in your portfolio just for the reason, well, one store value and two, a, a, 
appreciation, like you said, you might have a hundred grand on a door, and three, you can get out of it. How easy it is to sell a single family? I'm selling like that. So if I need money quick, like you can go and get a loan on it. If, let's say you've got a house that's 50%, you know, LTV at this point, you can go get a loan on it. You can fire sell it to an investor. You can sell. You can, you know, set it up, get the tenant out, uh, extract 100% of the value on the back end. But uh, someone said something. And, forget where I heard it, but it was like two or three years ago, his rates started to come up. And uh, in multifamily, it's only worth what another investor is willing to pay for the cash flow. Mm -hmm. However, in single family, it's worth what another investor is willing to pay for the cash flow and what a, what a homeowner is willing to pay for their family to live there. Mm -hmm. Think about That's that. So That's right. That down. So they're an emotional buyer and they're always going to pay more and they're always gonna overpay. Uh, I wanna bring this point up too, Chris. If you guys look around the world or you guys study other markets like look what happened in phoenix look what happened in vegas okay let's go outside the united states let's look what happened in, in australia in europe people rent if you want to buy like if you go to south korea for instance right one of our uh, investors from south korea if you want to buy a place in south korea you're spending you know a million a million five just to live somewhere just to say that you own it so if you guys think the situation's bad here look what's happening across the world so that's why i'm so bullish on on single family all you gotta do is just look up elsewhere and figure out what's already happened because it's going to continue to happen. Terry, what did you say? Investors will buy will buy cash flow. Yeah, you? investor buys uh, based on what the cash flow provides, which with debt and the way with how high debt is, right? Yeah, that's went down. So apartments that I sold in 2022 are not worth what they're the, the value is not what it was what I sold it for yeah. in 2022. But on a single family house. It's so more guys. It's, it's the values of less than what you now. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, but on a single family house, it's worth what a family is willing to overpay to put their family in it to live there. When I heard that, that was like, mm -hmm. it was like shit. He's right. And there's a whole lot more families than there are investors. There is. That's mm -hmm. that's why. That's the main reason why I like single family homes because. If you just get so lopsided on one asset class, you know, because there's pros and cons to all these asset classes. For sure. If you lopsided on just one asset class, you're missing a, a whole lot of, like right now, Terry's not worried. Terry, you have 55 million-ish in single family homes? Yeah. Are you worried about that, that asset class at all? Yeah. Not at all. Because not at all. You can, it just keeps going up. Yes. Well, if, 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 you, if you're on a 100 unit apartment complex, you can't piecemeal off 20 units because you're in a financial bind and say, hey, I need to get some cash. You have to raise again. So the way the way that I look at it, I know you're not a stock market guy, but if you own if you have a stock portfolio, right, and you need money, you can well now you can go borrow it if you're in Charles Schwab, right, and just borrow the money back out. Um, but if you wanted to sell, uh, I don't know, sell on Nvidia stock, you can do that because you have a diversified portfolio, and that's the ability, the one of the cool things with single family is if I have a highly appreciating property that I need money and I need access to it. I can just sell that one property like that. So one of the things that we do every renewal, every renewal month, um, we look at who's renewed. We rank, we uh, rank all of our tenants green, yellow, and red. It's a very simple management system. I don't try to overcomplicate stuff. You guys can't tell. But if they're a red, I know that that tenant sucks. If they're a yellow, they're in between. If they're in the green, that's a tenant we want to keep happy, right? We want to keep them in there. They're a good payer. They keep their house clean. Yada yada yada. But if they're in the red, I'm like, I'm identifying these properties. Then I'm looking on the REO schedule. I'm looking at, let's say, 1364 South Champion Avenue. I'm saying, okay, uh, this lady sucks, and we're just not going to renew her. And then in 30 days, she's out. Now I know that in the next 30 days, I can put that house up for sale, and I can extract my value in 90 days or less. Or if I wanted to sell, fire sell it to an investor, I could just fire sell it with the tenant in there, right? So, but you got to buy. Uh, sorry, uh, but. You got to buy in the right areas too. Like you can't buy all A class stuff or all C class stuff. You have to buy in that that niche to where you can rent it and still make cash flow. But then also too, you can sell it to another. That's such a good point. What you just said. That I want to write. This, you understand what he just said because you don't you don't want to buy a good single family house no. because yeah they make cash flow great for tenants if they're not wiping shit on the wall. But you can't sell them. That's the problem. You can't, you know, because those properties are only worth with another investor, another investor is, is willing to pay right. that cash flow. I can't sell it to a family. A family's not going to buy it. No. no. It's just going to be another investor, and you're going to have to give it away just like you bought it at a steal. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, what were we putting here? I forgot what we said. What was it that we put in? Yes. Yeah, and we stayed right in B. So, like, our average uh, 
So our average house value right now is right around like 230,000 for Columbus, Ohio. That's kind of it. like our, our hood stuff is like 140. Um, the newer built hedge fund style 2000 house is probably 350 to 375. So we're kind of right in that midpoint. Um, so yeah. What kind of data do you get in these things? So I used to go to community banks. I used to be all about these community banks, right? And, um, who, who deals with community banks, by the way? Okay, good. I, I think it's. I think you guys need to keep all of your lending relationships open at all times. Like you never know, you know, that shark lender that you're going to need, or that person that might cut your head off. You don't pay them back next Friday. You need to keep all those relationships, including your community banks. Um, so I, I was getting. Um, I locked in a bunch of stuff like four percent for five years right before. I didn't get all of it done, um, but now I'm, I'm going straight to DSCR in order to get these things to cash flow. I, I can't go to a community bank and pay half a percent. DSCR. DSCR, debt service coverage ratio. It sounded really smart there, didn't it? Yeah, I almost said that correctly too. Um, so debt service coverage ratio. And there's a ton of these lenders. They're all getting their, they're all getting their money from the same two places. Um, so no matter who you go to, Kiabi, RCN, you know, uh, whoever, right? Templeview, they're all getting their money from the same places. So, um, but we're generally getting like seven and a half percent, 30 years. I'm doing interest only at this point. So I'm kind of doing these Band-Aid loans is what I'm calling them because it's like a band-aid until rates come down, then I can get them on a 20 year, get them up, get them paying out some debt. But I'm a huge fan of, if you can cash flow it, get a mix of 15s, get a mix of 20s, get a mix of 25s, get some 30s, get some interest only. Because if you're that person that just does interest only, you're gonna turn 38 one day and never pay down an ounce of debt. Yeah. And then if something does happen, then you're screwed, right? But at the same time, you don't wanna like worry yourself to death to where you know, you're struggling to cash flow every month as it is, right? Roof goes bad, sewer line. You got 42 people who decide to move out on you in one I month. I saw a video you made. Oh, it's fucking bad. You had the <laughs> it's so bad right now, dude. I can't lie to you. It's no, bad. But the economy's rough. The economy's rough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. And this is the reality. That's why I wanted to bring it. It's the reality of being a landlord. You're going to have people that, that just destroy your places and you, you just fix them up and you got to spend another five grand just to get them there, right? Yeah. Um, I saw a video you did last week or week before. You had how many evictions in one day? Six. Six in one day. That's the reality. Then. Sheriff, bailiff, they're like, oh, let's go to the next one. We get in the cars, we load up. I always go to my evictions um, just because they get a little rough sometimes. And I just, as a leader in my organization, I want to be at the forefront of that. Um, just one of those things I, I just, yeah, I just like to do. And, and you got to be hands on, and you're in the, you're in, you're in the, the, the trenches, so to speak. Yes. And because you're not having doing real estate. Because I, I, you know, I don't like when they, they say on social media that, you know, I don't work in my business. Or, you know, I just get everybody to do everything for me. That's such bullshit. It's such bullshit. It's bullshit. It sounds good on the ground. It's not, it doesn't check off the box in reality. Yeah, if you have a team helping you, but somebody's dealing with the bullshit. And even though it's passive because you have a team, guess what they call it? Because I've got a big team. I get calls all day. Hey, this guy shit in this wall. This guy shot up this. You think that's really like passive? No. Then you start getting emotional about it. Yeah. You're like, man, why is he shooting my place up? Yeah, yeah. like I mean, <laughs> but that's <laughs> you could pick on somebody else, right? <laughs> so you did six evictions. You probably what, what was it cost to some of those to refix that? We got lucky on a few of them. I saw some of really yeah, nice yeah. Deal. They didn't beat them up too bad. No, like the floors are still intact. Thank yeah. God. But I mean, we got full time painters, like three full time painters. Yeah. So we're just sending these guys yeah. in left and right, having paint and sending in the maintenance guys and have them going after and yeah. fix them up. But uh, some of them got really, really fucked up, excuse my language, but I mean, that's the only way I can describe it. Okay. They got, they got fucked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so like, you know, we always talk about like hardening the property, you know, putting in your LVP, putting in granite countertops. Um, you know, we don't do like the shaker cabinets. We do the wood ones because we know that people are gonna fuck them up anyway. Mm -hmm. And we just paint them knowing that in my price point, it'll still sell. Dude, I mean, like, granite's cracked. You're talking the floors are just completely ripped up. Piss everywhere. They got a pool, you know, we have to go through and restraw the backyard. Like, just yeah. dumb stuff, man. Yeah. yeah. You ready for the good part of it? I know, we've been dogging like rentals. Who's excited now? Yeah. You ready to go buy some rental properties? Here's the thing. It's, it's, a, it's a give and take, right? You talk, we're talking bad about all these rental properties. I, I would still do it all over again. But here's a cool thing. Terry, do you pay much in taxes? I just paid for the first time two years ago. There you go. I hadn't paid taxes in probably eight, nine years, right? So you're doing all this, 
but there is a caveat to it. The government allows you depreciation if you own all these rental properties. And you have to look at these rental properties as a, as a store of value and depreciation is the two most important things to me. And then cash, then you obviously want it to cash flow, but you made a good point earlier. Nobody talks about this. And I keep thinking about this, I'm like, nobody talks about paying off their properties. Yeah. <laughs> I think, what's wrong with eventually paying off a property? One of my really, really good friends in Columbus, um, old school landlord, he's like 50 years old, um, wears a gold chain and a shirt that says no pay, no stay, all the time, no matter where we go, we got to like a state dinner and it's yeah. the same career. Uh, but he had all of his stuff paid off. And, but he's still dealing with the same shit that I, and I'm like, dude, you would make more money put it, lending your money to me yeah. at 13 or 14% than you make on the cash flow of these properties. So the appreciation just has not hit his head yet, right? And I'm like, you make money on these things kind of five eventually. You know, you make money on the spreads, you make money on the leverage, the advantages for taxes, uh, you can refi at will. Like, the cash flow is like a bonus, right? right. Especially if you've got active income, that's, that's where this really gets juicy because it just offsets all of it. And so that's why you'll see a lot of gurus that will sell education and then try to buy a bunch of rentals and then you know here's my course blah 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 you, you know you can you got to have some other business to feed this yes. you know whether it's construction that's kind of our other business is construction business so it's about to actually wish you fast yeah yep construction we have a, a little baby mastermind um and uh but you're also yeah, flipping. Yeah, flipping. You got to say like the medium and yeah. the fast money going it to, to cover. If you just did rental properties, would you have the lifestyle you have? No. no. So in 2018, I actually I went to a, a wholesaling course out in uh, or uh, mastermind out in uh, Phoenix. It was uh, the all in guys. Carlos. Yeah, Carlos and Sal. And I just wholesaled my first two deals. And I made like 44 grand. I was like, I'm rich. Like, <laughs> like I've never experienced this before. Like in one week, this is awesome. Um, but I had to like wrap my head around, you can't hang on to everything. Like you have to sell stuff. You have to identify when to keep stuff. Uh, one of the things that, that I always say is like, if you don't need it in your bank account, put that shit on your balance sheet. You guys should write that down. If you guys don't need it in your bank account, put it on your balance sheet. Because that is, if, if you're not gonna get a store of value that's better than that property if you buy in the right area. And then when you need it in two or three years, I mean, if it, dude, it's, it's there. For you younger guys, what you meant by balance sheet is mean your store value, your new real estate, your equity in your properties, right? Mm -hmm. Let's get some younger 20 year olds in here. I want to make sure we don't go past them. That was like the one smart thing I had in my, my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Mm -hmm. Guys, you can interject any questions while we're going. Yeah, yeah. conversational too, yeah. by the way. But this asset class to me is, you know, and you should still buy apartments, and I'm going to be talking about mobile home parks tomorrow. They're all good, right? Don't asset discriminate. Whatever you can get a great deal on, buy it. Would you buy, if you get an apartment complex right now for 60 cents on a dollar, would you buy it? Yes. Of course you would. Yep. If you can get a, an RV park for 60 cents, about five cents a dollar, would you buy it? Yep. Of course you would. Even though you're, you don't have any operational experience in RV, I would say. No, I mean, I wouldn't do a, like a one-off, a one -off, but like right. if there's enough scale in another market, yeah, yeah for sure. Absolutely. If it's in Columbus, Ohio, I don't care what it is, like I'm, yeah. I'm buying. Absolutely. Can you talk through um, the team dynamics here? Like as you've grown, Who's the right first hire? Who's yeah. what? What makes the real impact? For sure, the uh, first person I hired was a maintenance man. Um, it was just one of my homeboys I grew up with, and he was like trying to learn how to fix stuff. And you know, we're like living in these houses together, and mm -hmm. he's learning how to fix stuff. I'm learning how to buy properties, um, and then he eventually got good and got a job with the state, and now he's you know making buku bucks with the state, which is great for him. But um, I wish the first hire that I made was a personal assistant, like having whether it's a VA. Everyone knows what a virtual assistant is. If you guys are not using virtual assistants, it's the absolute biggest game changer you'll ever have. Uh, but I wish I would have like done that way earlier. Um, but today we have like our property management company, which I break it into three different buckets. We have leasing, financial, and maintenance. And the way that I run it is that we have these core people that are in the United States that are overseeing those departments. Then they have virtual assistants, basically like little personal assistants that help them do their job. That makes sense. So that way they're not doing any of the bullshit work. They're doing the highest level activity possible. Where's the best place to find these virtual assistants? Upwork. Go to upwork.com, just put in there exactly what you're looking for, and you'll have 10 responses in a day. And they're just doing mostly uh, administrative work? Yeah, uh, like, I mean, how many times do we buy a property and you're like, oh shit, I forgot to turn on the utilities. Damn it, I forgot to call the gas company. Man, I forgot to put insurance on the property. Man, I forgot to do this. 
Like, make them do it, right? Like, all that BS stuff that someone else can do, like, have them do it. Um, yeah, I have one. Are you personally training them yourself, like, just to give them to your standards, or are they already kind of coming out the gate with a, a, a broad knowledge, or at least, a, you know, some of a knowledge, real estate knowledge? Um, I, I, I don't, when you get on foot work? Yeah, I don't really need them to, because we, we have, like, training. I actually learned this from Thayer. Um, just record have your team record what they do on the computer. So if it's a task, just have them record it, save it, and then uh, we have this thing called a responsibility matrix. So literally it's every like one-off task that I can possibly think of in our business. Then we have to, and it's, dude, it's super simple. It's all in Excel. It's not some grand big thing. You just put in there what day of the week that task needs done, how long that task should be done, or a day of the month. Like for instance, with evictions, we don't file evictions till the 15th. I don't want to think about that shit until the 15th is. Or like AP, we, we do AP runs twice a month on the 10th and 25th. I don't want to see, you know, AP and how much we owe people, you know, all, every single day. But you just designate certain times for all that stuff. Um, but yeah, that's, and then you have them go look on there. There's a training video, they click on that particular task and they know what to do. Gotcha. Where are all you sim single family homes? Are they all within Ohio or? Just Columbus. Hmm. Let's talk about that because that is that is def definitely a disadvantage if you own single family homes is they're spread out. So if you're gonna yes. do single family homes, you don't wanna do it all over the country. You wanna do it in your in your city, in your backyard. Absolutely not. Um, Cause you gotta think, I mean, like for even for us, like even in the city of Columbus, we have a bunch of stuff on the south side, a bunch of stuff on the east side. We have some in this pocket in the north and then west. And then we have kind of these outliers over here that are in this really good neighborhood, but every time we go to fix shit over here, it's a 25 minute drive. So I know that's an hour out of that guy's day, plus he's gotta go to Home Depot if it's something we don't have on the truck. So then it's you know three, four hours to fix that one issue. And so you wanna make sure that you kind of cluster these things up to where eventually you can run it like a mini apartment complex, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, right? Um, so to me, that's, that's, that, that's really important. That is very important, and that's the disadvantage of single family homes, right? Whereas, you know, where Jason's talking about apartments, you know, you got a maintenance guy, he fixes everything right there. You don't lose that time of them having to travel. They fix, they can fix three or four problems on a 100 unit apartment complex all in the same spot. Whereas your maintenance guy is gonna travel all day to probably fix yeah. four things. And then you gotta make sure that, you know, they didn't stop for lunch for two hours. Right. Or they, mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't have a drink at lunch and then right. yeah, that type of stuff. Yeah. You see the give and take of these different asset classes? Why not make the switch to bigger multifamily? So I did, but um, I actually sold, so I had an 84 unit, some like brand 16, smaller, like uh, what he was saying with in-between type stuff. Um, I was spending 60 to 70% of our time on 40% of our portfolio. It made no sense from a logistics standpoint. And then what, uh, another, what other investors were willing to pay for these things, and I knew that rates were gonna you know, start rising, like it was, it was time to just, it was time to turn it in. And you sold at the right time. I remember when you sold yeah. a bunch of your apartments, you made a big rip. Yeah. I remember that. Big that rip. Was, that was 2022? 20, yeah. I sold them all. Um, the last one I sold, well, the last couple I sold was in the beginning of 2022. Yeah, I remember So that. I didn't have to pay taxes on that yeah. until and the end of last year. So you timed that right. You said, remember I talked about in my presentation, market cycles and time. If you have tried to sell that now, you wouldn't have. No. I'd be stuck with it. The guy that you sold it to is probably not a good spot. He's not a good spot. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's not a good spot at all. Because he don't, yeah, he don't understand time. Um, but yeah, like for me, like it's not, you know, if someone brought up an apartment complex that made sense, absolutely, man. It's just, it's, it's just, you manage them different, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it, single family houses, people want, people don't want to live in boxes. And now we have all these boxes everywhere, mostly on the luxury side, but um, we had, you know, some C-class apartments. We had some, a couple Bs. Um, we just, there's just such a, there's so many of these damn things. And it's like, like we have this random nine unit, for instance. Um, great part of town. I got the, this big mural. Uh, we had like the uh, city attorney actually take a picture in front of the, uh, my mural. Like pretty badass, right? I can't rent these things for more than 1200 bucks to save my life. And they've been $1,200 for the last four fucking years. Apartments? Apartments. Yep. Just it, it, there's so many of them, and people have their choice. But then when I put up a house, it's like, you know, these people that are moving out this month, it's like I'm bumping the rent two, three hundred dollars because people need the space. People are start. I don't know if you guys are seeing this, but this is something I'm seeing. People are starting to shack up again. So you're not getting the single mom or the single dad. You're seeing people start to work shit out again. People are starting to fix their, their 
marital problems and move back in together. Um, or it's like, hey, we've got a mom here, a mom here, boom, we've got three bedrooms with a basement, we can afford 1800 a month together, cool. But another argument to the single family versus multifamily is if, if single families are so bad, why is Black Rock, Blackstone, Vanguard, and all that buying stuff? Mm -hmm. Someone tell me. I mean, I, I, that's I mean, as soon as they started coming in, I was like the first guy, I was like, this is bad. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you remember, like 2018, 2019, I was huge on social, just like, guys, this is not good. They're gonna end up buying everything. Yeah. And now, now that they're not buying everything, now everybody wants to cry about it. Yeah. But eventually, once rates do come down, like I was just recently at the uh, the IMN conference, it's the uh, International Single Family Rental Conference down in Miami. All these guys want from Wall Street is just to know when rates are coming down and have that first rate cut. And they're coming. Like, they're not going to stop. So I would encourage, if you, if you guys can just buy as many of these things as you can, you will not regret it. Just as long as you're stealing it legally, morally. ethically, and morally. Legally, morally, and ethically. You said something really good, because that is the indicator that the next cycle, as soon as they drop rates, and I could be wrong, but I doubt it, it's not too often they drop rates and they go back up again. If they're gonna start dropping rates, they should just keep coming down, yeah. historically speaking. They don't usually just drop it and go back up, but who knows? The only issue I'm saying that now, if I could be wrong, and, and I would like your thoughts on this, is that if they drop rates and everybody starts buying again, we don't have enough inventory. So it's gonna jack everything back up, and I'm worried that all the price is gonna go crazy again, and they're gonna have to you know, go ahead and increase the rates again. Who, who was, uh, show of hands, who was wholesaling in 2021, 2022? Okay, every hedge fund was overpaying for property, am I right? Like, open door, buddy. Yeah, like it was nuts, right? Uh, I remember we sold a property at the end of 2022 and we knew it was like gonna be the last one. We sold a property for like, we had it on a contract for like 270 and they're gonna, and their max was 360 and we got it to go to 370 on it. And I'm like, you gotta be shitting. But we knew it was like the last one and that was the last one. Um, but that's gonna come back. So when it comes back, like, you know, do you, I mean, you can choose to sell to a family. Again, you can choose to sell to an investor, yeah. but you're making your money in the interim. Right, just by being able to hang on. And the cool thing about what Terry does is that if you guys are wholesaling, which I recommend all of you guys do direct to sell marketing, if you're wholesaling, the, the, the low hanging fruit is single family homes for wholesaling and flipping. And you just cherry pick the best ones mm -hmm. and you keep them in your portfolio. Maybe every fifth or sixth property you wholesale and flip, keep them in your portfolio. Terry, you want to talk on that? Is that kind of what yeah. you're doing? Um, not now, but I was. So when I learned how to wholesale in 2018, because I Literally, like from like 2015 to 2018, a deal would come in. I'm like, man, I can't buy it. Hey, and I would call like one of my buddies. I'm like, hey, I don't have money to buy this, but here, maybe you can have it. I could have been making you know, spreads, just you know, you know, putting deals together. But uh, I didn't understand it. So, anyways, after I learned how to wholesale, um, built the team, had like five young dudes in my office, had the bomb, <laughs> had all that stuff, and I would just cherry pick all the deals that came through. Um, and then combination between direct uh, direct mail, we had a shit ton of cold callers, we had all that stuff set up. As soon as 2022 hit, um, these guys eventually, because this is something that does happen, once guys start counting your pockets, they're gonna go off and do this shit on their own. It's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And when they do go off on their own, like you gotta shake their hand, just be like, hey man, it's been a good run, just let me know how we can partner in the future, right? Um, so that kind of happened at the end of 2022, everyone ended up branching off on their own. So now we buy deals from those guys. Um, this is a, a cool thing that we're doing now too with uh, our office building is I'm doing like this wholesale incubator thing where like they get access to me, my team, um, you know, systems, all the stuff that we're doing. And then I get first crack at all their wholesale deals. Mm -hmm. So now we don't have to spend as much money on marketing or any of that stuff. Heard what he just said? Mm -hmm. yeah. He's cheating legally, morally. <laughs> <laughs> So we gotta start thinking that that's that's great. Yeah, uh, but I don't want to be on I don't want to be on the phone with sellers. Yeah. I don't want to hear those conversations. I've been hearing those conversations for ten fucking years. Yeah. Like I <laughs> want to talk to business owners at this point. If I'm gonna be in the single family business, I want to talk to business owners. It's how much more fun is it when you can bring someone in a chair and be like, hey man, how you been? Light up a cigar, man. Here, you want a bourbon? Cool. Just lay back, lay back in my massage chair, and then we start working out some deals. Like that's fun to me, right? Like. Um, you can't do that with a seller, right? But like, you know, with whole other wholesalers, business owners, you know, go go work out together and then, you know, hey man, if, if I can do more pull-ups than you, you gotta sell me this deal at this price. How much more fun is that shit? <laughs> like, been talking to a seller, well, I can't sell this house and it's been in my family for 50 generations. Like, I just don't wanna hear that shit anymore, man. <laughs> I mean, no, no offense, you guys, I, I just, 
Sorry, yeah. Danny. I don't think so. And, and it's a lot of headset. <laughs> it, it's, you it's, love a headset. <laughs> <laughs> And, it, and it's a grind, you see? I mean, because if you don't naturally progress, like my progression, and get the, how important is it to raise bride of mind? It's, it's everything. It's everything. It's everything. Let's talk about that. Um, so I sucked originally at raising private money because I didn't have like, I didn't, you know, didn't have like family money to, or friends or any of that stuff. Uh, I was a little bit of a party animal in like 2016 through 2018. So, um, Got, got around the bars and bar owners and all that stuff. Ended up meeting some of the right people, thank goodness. Um, so some of those guys were what I call like my shark lenders that they'll cut your head off next in two Fridays if you don't pay them back. Um, you know, some of these guys I met were fiduciaries, investment advisors, met a lot of great people. Um, one of the uh, strategies I used is with this investment advisor, I know you don't, uh, you advise against the stock market, but I'm kind of an argument guy. I, no, I advise root coin and not get caught. <laughs> Fair enough. I like it. Um, so through uh, my investment advisor now, he has this massive network. I think I got like, I don't know, like one, what's one Bitcoin now? 60 some thousand? Yeah, one. Dude, I, mean, I, guess, I got some shit coins, man. I don't want to talk about it. It's so <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any NFTs. They don't know how bad it is. Do you have NFTs? I have no NFTs. You did do crypto that. was all well. Crypto and I did two Amazon, Amazon stores. And, yeah, that's, yeah, that was bad. I thought passive income was real, man. <laughs> <laughs> all I gotta do is wire my money to Haiti, and then they send it to Bermuda, and then I get ten grand a month. Passive, no hassle. Um, but uh, yeah, what was we talking about? <laughs> Stock market. Stock market. So uh, yes, my best investment advisor. Um, so once he started loaning money to me and he could see that, hey, like in his brain, he's so trained that the stock market is going to rise 8 to 10% per year, and I'm paying him 14 with points, he's like, there's no way this shit's real, right? So now once he's got these riskier clients, he's like, well, this kid's going to pay me 14 and 2, and he can get other people on board with that that want to be uh, riskier. He's got a whole network of people. So one of the things um, I always say is connect with the connectors. Right, mm -hmm. so he's a, he's a master connector. So I want to connect with that person. So now I have access to his entire network. So that's that's been like a high hole for me. Mm -hmm. That's that is a gem. Mm -hmm. What you just said, guys. Connect with connectors. Go find and communicate them. If you're a good communicator and, and you can connect with people, you ain't got to be smart. Just connect with them. Everybody here should be talking to everybody to find out what they're good at. That's so good. So back to the basics. Could you walk through what one of those initial conversations would sound like? Um, <coughs> yeah, with a private lender? Yeah. Um, sure. So um, ask me what I do. What do you do? So I invest in real estate, and um, I give people above average returns by investing in my real estate deals. If you know of anybody, please refer them over to me. You're going to come back and you be like, why the fuck didn't you ask me? So I always ask if someone else is interested. I never ask the person directly. Mm -hmm. But I just put out a post uh, like an hour ago, like, hey, here's the four houses we bought last week. Um, these were funded by private lenders. Like, social media is a powerful tool. These were funded by private lenders, people just like you and I, wink, wink. If you are if you know of anybody that might be interested in getting above average returns in real, secured by real estate, DM me. I'm looking for private lenders only because you don't want to get hard money and all that stuff. You want to say specifically what you're looking for. So like I've really only used hard money and I know nothing about private money. So are you just like, what What do you mean by above average returns? Are you giving like 10% so you're going to save yourself 3%? It's, I'll pay 12. What would you pay? 12. Yeah, 12. Shit, I'll pay 14. I'll pay 14 too. If you're a good operator, <laughs> you, you can pay 12. But with interest rates, they're, they have been wanting 14, 15. If you're brand new, if you're just getting started, they're going to probably want 15 to 16 out of you. Why don't I just use hard money at first? Well, if you, so on hard money, like we use a lot of hard money. We fund most with hard money on the upfront. Um, but then you always have those gaps, that, 50, that 30 grand you gotta come up with as your down payment, or that 20 grand. You're getting 100% from a hard money. I think it's like three points, three or four points. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. paying these points. Yeah. But, but then like you have to, but then things. it's like most of these hard money lenders, you pay, not, what is it, like 90% on the first, and then 100% on the second. So they'll fund 90% of your upfront purchase, but then only only 100% on the second. So you're always you're always like have this like 20, 30 grand on every deal. Like, then what the difference between hard money and, yeah. and private so money? Yeah. So points are the points actually end up being more closer to 19%. Yes. Yeah. Three points. I'll do. They're, they're raking it. 
Yeah. Um, so pr the difference between private money is this: these are individuals. These are people that we can negotiate the rates, we can negotiate the terms, we negotiate everything. It's a handshake. You're going to get um, a couple documents. You're going to get a promissory note. Okay, that's my, and that's that includes my personal guarantee that I am going to pay you back with interest. You're also going to get a lien position in the property. Most of the times, and you got to explain when they're getting for if you're going to fund it on the first and you need uh, a second lien, you got to let them know they're going to be in second lien position, right? But most of our stuff that we do with private uh, private is going to be in the first lien position. Uh, now, hard money, these guys they, they, they broker money for a living, so but they're always going to want you to have skin in the game. Where it's like you can go to a private lender and probably get 100% financing, whereas hard money they're going to want you to have some skin in the game, meaning you know 10%, 15% dots. I mean, sometimes. So it, private money is the way to go. I, I don't, all the flips we do, we put zero money down, but it's all based on relationships. Like I said, you can negotiate it. You know, we don't put any money down. I, I can just make a call about, hey, I need $150,000. Just, hey, what I, you don't even ask for an appraisal. It's relationship driven. You know, I pay on the back end, you yeah, and I pay everything on the back end. You usually have you know, 18, 20 flips going, I, I can sleep at night because I'm not servicing debt. And, but that, but that's you have to build those relationships. You're not going to start off like that in the beginning. Let's talk about relationships with your private money with this. Yeah. What that looks like is being a good, you know, custodian of somebody else's money. Yeah. Um, so, uh, rule number one: if one of your lenders calls, I don't give a shit what you're doing. Answer the phone. That's so good. Like, that's right. I don't care if you're at a funeral, whatever. You step outside and take the call, no matter who it is. Um, so you got 50 grand, 250, what, 500? Just take the call, right? Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, I, I'm huge on gifts. I don't know what your guys' love language is. Like one of mine's gifts. I like when people send me bourbon in the mail or yeah, yeah. you know, a uh, pack of cigars or something like that. It's, it's cool. But figure out like you know a, a cool gift that you can give them or even like a handwritten note. Just something. And actually, I got this from Bayer as well. Um, like handwritten notes. Like just letting them know that hey, nice doing business with you. But it's just nurturing the relationship, man. Like it's it's not hard to call and ask how they're doing, man. You know, and it's, hey, I know you're busy, man. I just call and see how you're doing. Like, little shit, I don't know, just be a fucking human being. Yeah. Like, it, it's not that not that difficult. But you, you're saying something that makes me think. Yeah. But you guys that you're answering phones for, you know, trying to get deals with direct to sell marketing, when, you, when you're not doing that, you should be doing exactly what he's doing to fill the gap. You should be on the phone talking with people that got money and just communicate and send, send them gifts. Yeah. Ask them if they, hey, they got any deals they're interested in, in funding. You, you guys, you guys got to handle the phones all day, every day. If you're gonna do this, I, I, I think well, to your point, how many times do we get on the phone with a seller or you know trying to find deals because then we won't do the same thing when we're trying for yeah we're trying to call a community bank or trying to call for a lender or trying like you gotta do the same shit. Money is just important as finding a deal. I mean, finding a deal is primary because you don't you can't get money unless you have a deal, obviously. But where most of you guys are gonna get hung up is going to get hung up on you don't have enough money to do your deals. Ansley, would you not be, like, if you had unlimited access to capital, you already know, you'd be a billionaire, right? It's the truth. Money is, is money not the biggest hang up? It's always the biggest hang up. So don't just focus on just finding deals. 50-50, put 50% 50 of your time finding deals, 50% of your time raising money. I love what you said about the gifts and talking with these. These, uh, these guys that got money. Tell us some more things about the money side. This is real good. Yeah. Uh, how, how, are you, how are you raising money? Um, so I, I used to go to a bunch of banks, and that was kind of like my big thing is I would go to, um, I would go to these small banks that were around Columbus, Ohio, but I would find every bank that I've never heard of. And the ones that were slightly outside of the metro, I knew that they weren't gonna lend money in Zanesville, Ohio, but they need to place money in Columbus, Ohio, because they don't have shit going on in Zanesville, Ohio. So then I would go to these banks, I would shake hands, or I would try to find someone that I might know at that bank or a LinkedIn connection with someone that I knew at that bank um, and just try to make a relationship or have someone do a warm email intro. Uh, we borrowed almost 10 million bucks from Richwood Bank out of Richwood, Ohio, all because a guy who was a bar owner ended up doing uh, business with Richwood. And he's like, yeah, uh, they funded some of my bar, blah, blah, blah. I was like, dude, can you do an email intro? And he introduced me to the VP of commercial lending in 2017 and because i had that connect that mutual connection right there and he basically put his stamp on me say hey this guy's good for it i was just dude i was banging out loans for like two years so but um on the banking side like just it's the same thing it's like law of averages like the more people you call 
better shot you're gonna have a good mic. You just said another good thing. Just because one or two, three or four people that got money tell you no, you can't quit. Most of you guys have quit. Coach Bird talked about this. You gotta be a savage out there. If somebody tells you no, go to the next one. You know how many banks told me no on my first mobile home park? Six. And I already had a big balance sheet before I bought that. But once I got my first one done, it, it, it didn't stop. So, Terry, talk about the persistence. You know, to get to where you, you've gotten, you're not a quitter. No, you can't be. Can't be. Um, case in point, I pulled this up on my phone. So that same bank, Richwood Bank, right? Um, that's a loan denial yesterday. Yeah. So just because they're lending to you today doesn't mean they're going to lend to you tomorrow. Their appetite, uh, you know, for certain asset classes may change. What people are lending money on may change. People might get scooped out about the market. That may change. But just because it's yes today doesn't mean it's not going to be yes tomorrow and vice versa. It could be no today. It could just be money's tied up, right? And it's going to be yes in two weeks. And then money, it, it flows, man. You know, so especially with lenders or people that are professionally lending, it's like once it comes back in, they want it to go right back out. Yeah. So you got to be there or, or know like, hey, this is when they're going to have money coming back in. So that way you can you can follow back up. The same way you would with a, a seller. Same with that way. Yeah, so private money for your flips and you use that for your long-term rentals and then with the private, do you, are you always trying to cash them back out basically with the refi or something like that? Um, yeah, so I, I used to get, so the way I would do it, I, was, I would borrow hard money and I, I'd fill the gaps with either private or my own cash, okay? Or I'd borrow private money on the front and then I would do the bird method and I'd refinance out with the community bank with rates the way that they are, and most banks want a 20 or a 25 year note, um, I can't cash flow on 25 years at eight, eight and a half percent. So I need 7% interest only debt on 30 years. So that's why I'm going to the, these DSCR lenders, which you could do a Google search and find 20,000 of them. Um, I get a referral code if they want one, but like, you know, it, you can Google and someone's gonna give you a call. I mean, there, there's so much money out but there. But you're always trying to place. pay back like the friends and family that did the private money, and trying to pay them back. Yeah, so when you fund it on the up, when, whenever you fund it on the upfront, whenever you refinance, everything gets paid off on, on the upfront. Yeah. Okay. Yep. They're not they're not letting you money for thirty years basically. No, no. These are short term notes. These are most people is six to nine, you know, nine to twelve months. And then once you refinance out with the bank, then um, they're take they they pay all that off and then you know, if uh, people want to get that same amount of return, they're like, Hey, where's the next deal? Yeah. Yep. The, the thing is, guys, if, if you match up direct to sell marketing and you're a stud of raising private money and you do that, you you can't help but to build. I built most of my wealth in the past five, six years from doing that because if you can get a, 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 a seller on the line and you're getting this deal for 50 cents on the dollar and you tell them you can close on it in a week, it's a superpower. And you really can because you got, you know, every time they can hear want to give you money, that, that's how you got to do it. So if you guys are not doing direct to seller marketing and raising private money, you're not going to better go against a guy like Terry and me who are, are doing that. Terry, the deals that you're getting, so you're doing direct to seller marketing now or are you calm? I've calmed it, yeah. you calmed it, yeah. Okay. So over the last definitely six to eight months, yeah, calmed Yeah. Just at this point, we just don't need to. Right. I mean, it's social media, it's email list. It, 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 I, I'm big on building email lists. Mm -hmm. So any seller, um, invest, put realtors on there, send emails, I'm huge on that. Um, and then, you know, just having the network at this point over the last 12 years, it's, we don't really have, you know. But you built, we're gonna talk about the triangle, it's top of the triangle, most important, the brand. Yeah. People know, like, and trust you. Cause you've been at this for how long? 12 years, 13 years, years, yeah. 10 years, we're gonna talk about decades. Think in terms of 10 year cycles. It's gonna take you eight to 10 years to really get a, a good strong holding on you. You have all the connections now, you've built the portfolio, you have a process, a system, you have people working underneath you from now. Now it's just time. You keep yeah. doing what you're doing over the next, say you do it for another 20 years, how old are you? 38. So dude, you got, you probably got 30 years left. I don't know, man, my head doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you, you, you pick up all these things and you see these speakers, they, they all have the same commonality. They raise the private money. Go ahead. Yeah, but uh, you know, I had to do that from 2018 to 2022. Mm -hmm. Like we had to go direct to seller to grab all of these deals. You know, I had to have five guys in my office, you know, banging gongs and, you know, run around the office like idiots and doing balloon parties and j just the whole, it was, it was a fun culture. Don't get me wrong, but like 
you know, these guys went off and went on their own. And, and now it's like, I've realized that, hey, we don't really need to go that far anymore. And I can kind of step, I don't want to say step back, but yeah. make it more of a lifestyle business. I don't have to be in the office every single moment, mm -hmm. every single day. You just said something. It's, it can be a lifestyle business for you now. It, it took a lot of fucking hard ass work and grind yeah. to get to where you're at, where you can do that. Yeah, that shit doesn't happen. You, there's no way you could have lifestyled it up until now. No, there's no way. No fucking way. <laughs> no way. You're gonna, it doesn't you're work. gonna put it in and it's gonna hurt. Yeah. That's the way it is, man. Uh, you know, Patrick Ben David talks about this all the time. He talks about these 10 or 20 year runs. And sometimes like we beat ourselves up because we feel like we're not, like I feel like I've done shit yet. Yeah. Like I literally feel like I've done nothing, right? Um, the goals I had before I was 40, like, I'm probably not going to hit them. I'm still striving for them. Um, but, like, you know, this shit takes 10 or 20 years, man. Like, and you have to be okay with that. You got to be okay with losing some hair and, you know, putting on some weight or, you know, maybe, you know, having a little bit less balance. Wait, you don't want six pack in your million? Mm -hmm. No, dude. Like, no. What? Is that a requirement now? I, some, I, I've been seeing on social media. I did, I did nice pack this <laughs> morning. I'm sorry, man. I did nice pack this morning. That's my fault. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, he, you know, he talks about that, you know, it's just, you know, you have to look at the long-term time horizon of all this stuff. And that's, that's why, what is it? It's college. college. So that's why I go to college for a really long time and rack up a lot of debt. Yeah. Good debt, right? Bad debt to my speech. I like yeah. that. Good debt. A lot of loans, right? And then Biden's not going to pay back. Yeah. But our tenants are going to pay them back. That's right. Yeah. See, I'm giving you the whole thing now. Yeah. Um, but it just, it, it takes time. And uh, one of the biggest things that, I, that I'll say, we talked about this in one of my masterminds is, just staying power. Like, how long can you stick in the game? Like, how long can you stay? Because um, this managing this shit's tough. Like, it's hard. And like, uh, if I was honest, you know, we're going, we're fucking going through it right now. Like, it's it's tough. It's all hands on deck. I called in, you know, one of my buddies from like um, Crooksville, Ohio, to come help paint. You know, I haven't talked to him in like four years. Like, you know, I got a babysitting and you know, take five phone calls a day from me. Like, it's hard. You know. Um, but you just gotta stay in the game. The longer you stay in the game, the wealthier you get. Yeah. And it beats the W two. Nothing against you guys at the W two. Did you go back to the W two? Uh, no. 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 So you can either you can either work for the man that's that's trying to build his dreams, or you can build your own dreams. Either way, it's gonna hurt. You understand? It hurts either way. There's no way around it. Y'all looking for the easy shit. Mm -hmm. Just embrace how hard it's gonna be. And, and, and no, it's a journey. It's hard. It's supposed to be hard. That's what makes it fun. You look back 20 years from now, and you're like, shit, look what I did. Can you imagine if you were yet today, 10 years ago, when you first started? No, no. Because back then, like, when I first uh, quit my job, I bought, I, actually, this is how I quit my job. I bought 16 houses and a triplex in one day. This was April 11, 2013. I went in and quit on April 12th. I got really liquored up that night. Got the courage to quit the next day. And uh, took my team out, got them sloshed on lunch, and went in and quit, and I'm like, holy shit, I gotta go rehab all these houses. And I had 34 units, units, because I had this triplex. Um, and I'm like, I gotta go figure out how to rehab and refinance all these houses. And I remember directly after that too, like I had my first month of where my bank account literally went up like 14 Gs. And I was like, man, like, this cash flow is real, man. You know, but I didn't have any problems. They were all, you know, newly rehabbed, all that stuff. And then uh, I went out and started a brewery. Uh, you know, invested in some gyms, uh, bought storage units, just, I didn't know what to do with my time, right? And I thought that like that part was over, but it's like, once you get good at something, like just continue to do that one thing. That's why like everyone hated on the single family stuff for the longest time, but like, if you get good at something, man, just fuck it, like who cares? Like, you know, you don't have to be the biggest multifamily or commercial guru, no, no offense to you guys that do that. I, I admire it a lot, but. You know, if you find something you're good at, just stay with it. And you just said something. What one person's running is not going to be the other person. You don't have to be the biggest swimming dick. You know? you don't have to be. It's okay not to be. You know, do what you have. Have a goal and say, living free. <laughs> <laughs> have, have some goals of where you want to be and have an end point. Because your life cycle as a body you're in is going to die. So, Say, hey, I'm going to have maybe maybe 100 houses. Maybe it's 100 million in assets. But you got to have a, a time and point where you're like, hey, okay, I, it was a good run. But for, for most of you guys, if you like me, I think most of you guys have the entrepreneur spirit. In your mind, it's never enough. It's never enough. And you'll never arrive. You're all trying to, well, I'm going to, I'll arrive when I have 100 million bucks. Dude, I guarantee if you have 100 million bucks, you're like, how do I get 500 million? 
it never ends. So, Tara, if you kick the bucket next week, you had a good life, are you happy where you at? I'm not happy, but you know, but yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a good run. It's been a good run? It's been a good run. Yeah, I got some shit I gotta do first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of shit. So, I got a bigger boat to buy too. Yeah, you I just took on water last week, so oh, shit, I got <laughs> Maybe it's a boat that you wanna buy too. Who yeah, it's on the list. Mm-hmm. So I felt like you set up a perfect question on like the bigger why. Like what's really driving, what's driving you? Uh, uh, at this point, it's my, it's my uh, you know, my, my kids, yep. for sure. Um, you know, just making sure that I'm, because um, you don't want to be that dude that's like, you know, sells everything, retires, and then you end up, you know, you know, going this way because you don't know what to do with your time and, and all that stuff. Um, but I mean, I think we're all happiest when we're building something. I mean, is that true? That's so true. You're happy like, when you're building something. I mean, uh, like, and, and I brought up that point, like, you know, I went out and started, like, when I had that first month of pass, passive income, um, you know, I went out and started the brewery. I was a 95% owner in that brewery, and literally, it, it almost took me out, man. I thought it was what I wanted to do with my friends, and thought it was a good idea. Bad idea. Very bad idea. Um, and, you know, I lost four or five friendships off of that. Um, they're, they were, like, best friends, and now I don't have them, so... Um, you know, to, to say what why is, I think just continuing to build, man, and it doesn't have to be at like a rocket ship pace. It can just be continuing to build business. Uh, you know, I just bought a commercial building in the middle of downtown Columbus, um, and uh, I'm a 50-50 partner in this gym called the, it's called the Pros Gym, but it's um, the official gym of the Arnold Classic, because Arnold Classic comes to Columbus every year, and it's one of the four um, historic buildings that was built along with the State House in 1872. So like, that's like a legacy piece, man. It's something that's like occupying time, something I'm super passionate about. Um, but I think just continuing to build stuff, man, having a lot of fun along the way, that's important. That's one of my core values. This shit has to be fun. If you're not having fun, you're not gonna work hard and you're not gonna make money. Mm-hmm. But like, this shit's just like serious and hard and grunt and ice bath and abs and all this shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who wants to do that shit, right? Like, I'm all about working out, you know, five, six, seven days a week, but like, Dude, like, you got to have some fun in this stuff, too. I mean, your wife, your kids, or husbands, uh, they want to have fun. They want to enjoy the fruits of this labor, man. You know, they want your time, you know? You know, do some cool trips. I mean, did you, how many cool trips do you do all the freaking time? Once, twice a month. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome, man. I mean, you're living life by design. It's, it's what it's about, so. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> no idea. Anybody else? Yeah, Terry, when you were to go on direct to seller, what was your favorite source of Kirk Hall. Kirk Hall. Yeah, it's just predictable. When you're doing only around Columbus? Mm-hmm. How, what happens when you call the data? We Columbus? did. We did. Um, so here's where I screwed up. Um, so we were the Columbus Home Company. So I was trying to be, I was trying to basically corner the market, right? Um, so we were the Columbus Home Company, and everything was Columbus Home. I had this golf cart, Columbus Home, had all our vehicles tattooed, Columbus Home. And I was like, Fuck it, let's go to Cleveland. Let's go. Um, uh, Jason's in Cleveland, right? Um, uh, Cleveland, let's go to Cincinnati. So I bought OhioHome.com, which wasn't cheap. Um, and then we were just, we were fucking up, man. Like, we were losing money left and right. And just, it was too much too soon. Um, I read this book called The Art of War. You've heard of that book, right? Okay, one of the best things I ever did, I opened up that book to this one page that said, instead of taking your armies wide, you got to take your armies deep. And I'm like, dude, I've been doing the right thing all along. Just go as deep as you can in your one market. So when people ask, like, hey, why don't you expand? I'm like, dude, I tried that, and it just didn't work for me. So I don't want to go back to that. And, like, if you can just corner your market and be the guy in your market, like, what's wrong with that? How do you keep getting more data in Columbus to keep calling? <laughs> we, just kept, we just kept buying data, man. Yeah. Kept buying data. Uh, kept hitting the same people. Yeah. Um, and then eventually we had to scale back. We had 12 callers at one point. We scaled that back to eight, and we went to bringing all of them in house, so that way we could train them. Um, that helped, and we just it was a constant like learning curve. You hired them on a farm. Um, yeah, eventually did. And the other cool thing that we did too is we found a family, and then they were hiring the rest of their family. Yeah. But then like you'd have a shitty family member, and then you had to tell them this person can't. This person's on text this week because they suck. <laughs> um, but it was an easy way. Like once you find an end with a family, like you can generally get more people. Yeah, could have did that. All right, all this stuff makes sense? You see the the pros of single family homes and the cons? 
Give it up a tear. Take about a 15 minute break and we'll have the last speaker before we go to dinner tonight.